reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to stop. This morning, let's take our Bibles and turn in the Old Testament to the book of Micah. Micah follows Jonah. Micah prophesied about 750 B.C. on down to 686 B.C., a long, long ministry. He is speaking mainly to Jerusalem in the southern kingdom. He also talks to Samaria in the northern kingdom. And he prophesies about their future destruction because of their idolatry, their future restoration uh, of the state of Judea, which we're still seeing being developed. And he also rebuked the people of Judah because of their dishonesty and their idolatry. Very timely messages because we need that today, don't we? Today we're going to look at Micah 1 through 4 under the title Judgment and blessing. God's going to, in chapter 1, talk about judgment coming because of their sin. Chapter 2, restoration will come as they repent. Number 3, judgment is going to come on the rulers because they're the leaders, they're responsible. And then chapter 4, blessings will come, of course, in the glorious millennium. So uh, this is a timeless message. We need it today. As we do wrong, there's judgment, and as we do right, there is blessing. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we're grateful for this chance to study your word. Help us to really understand it and be totally changed by it. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 1 of the book of Micah. The word of the Lord came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So there were three kings with good long tenures, and he was the prophet, uh, one of the major prophets during that time. And he saw these things concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. So here's his first message. It's going to be chapters 1 and 2, talking about God's judgment, and then following that, the restoration. Hear all you peoples. Listen, O earth, and all that is in it. Let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. So it's like we're having a trial. And now God is going to stand up and take the case against the people of Judah and of Israel because of their sins. Behold, the Lord is coming out of his place. He will come down and tread on the high places of the earth. The mountains will melt under him and the valleys will split like wax before the fire, like waters poured down a steep place. All this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob and is it not Samaria? That's the northern capital. And what are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? And that's the southern capital. Notice the transgressions, verse 5, the sins, and also the high places. The high places were the places that they chose to worship their own idols. They came into the land of Canaan. God had said to them through Moses and then Joshua, do not worship the idols of this world, of these people. I've cast them out. I'll do the same thing to you. Well, they went right in and they did not obey God. They began to go to those high places, those lush high places in the mountains where they worshiped Baal and Ashtoreth and so many others. And they began to worship those same gods. It's uh, sad for Christians to be caught up in the world. Uh, we start off uh, perhaps in Sunday school at home learning about Jesus and then we get caught up in the world and the world's ways. It even infiltrates the church and we can find that the message of the world gets into the pulpit, it gets into the pews, it gets into the music, it gets into all of this where we want to have entertainment. I shouldn't be judging, I'm just jealous because we have a low ceiling. My wife told me 
I'm pea green with envy. There's a church in Atlanta which is now going to have aerial acrobatics during the worship. So you can lift your praises to Jesus and see people swinging on high bars and what have you. Now we can't do it. Our, our ceiling's too low for that. But that's what they're doing because it's going to bring people in. Whatever it takes to bring the people in and their money, let's do it. Well, that's idolatry, isn't it? Jesus said you can't serve God and mammon. You can't serve God and the ways of the world instead. And so um, let's pray that their insurance is high enough to be able to cover whatever happens there in that scene. But this is what's going on. And one of our local boys here, I'm just jealous because I'm, I'm too chicken, but he got the attention of the crowd, got his Harley Davidson and wrote it right up on the stage. And he declared in the, in the Times Union, soon I will be the biggest church in the Northeast. And he's growing. He's growing. He just had a brand new church open up last week and whatever. But whatever floats your boat. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus. Amen. All right. So God's coming down. You know, it's great to say, Jesus, come on down. Come on in. Check me out. But when you do that, you have to be able to be sure you can pay the price. Because he may come in and say, not well done, but you need to change this. You need to change that. So verse 6, Therefore I will make Samaria a heap of ruins in the field, places for planting a vineyard. I will pour down her stones into the valley, and I will uncover her foundations. This beautiful city is going to be destroyed. Now he's writing this before the fall of the northern kingdom. Uh, that was 722 BC. And uh, he's saying it's going to be leveled. The Assyrians are going to come on here and level this city. Their carved images shall be beaten to pieces, and all who pay as a and all her pay as a harlot shall be burned into the fire. And all her idols I will lay desolate, for she gathered it from the pay of a harlot, and they shall return to the pay of a harlot. What does that mean, the pay of a harlot? Well, we know that worship uh, in those situations, especially with Baal and his female consort Ashtoreth, they were gods and goddesses of fertility. And the way you would induce the god of fertility to bring rain for the crops, to bring babies, would be to have sexual intercourse. And so here we have the tithes and offerings, and in other churches there, they raise their funds through intercourse. The people would come and pay the temple priests and priestesses, the prostitutes, male and female, and have sex with them right at the altar, trying to induce Baal or Ashtoreth to bring forth rain and crops and prosperity or children. And so that was the pay of a harlot. They were selling their bodies for worship there. And that money went into the gold for the idols, and God's angry. Because God's the one who brings rain. He's the one who brings babies. He's the one who brought the gold. And they're using all of that for themselves. I wonder how God feels today when he looks at the gifts that we have, bodies that work, minds that work, talents that work, jobs we can hold down. And we don't take that money and bring the first tenth into him, that first tithe. We don't give him the first tenth of our time, the first tenth of our decision making. We just give it to the world. And we go out and spend it on the world. It makes him angry. Well, he says now in verse 8, Therefore, I will wail and howl. This is our friend Micah. Because the prophet feels the Lord. My, my wife is beginning to move in this area more recently where she's spending good amounts of time in prayer. And uh, the good thing is she's drawing close to the Lord. It's an emotional toll on her. Sometimes she's weeping. Last week she was weeping for Israel and Jerusalem. And so this is part of what you do when you intercede and when you draw close to the Lord. You begin to take on the burden of the Lord. And uh, it can sometimes be very taxing, but very rewarding. So our friend Micah now has to give a message to his people. And many times they had to live the message out in their natural lives. So, I will wail and howl. I will go stripped and naked. I will make a wailing like the jackals and a mourning like the ostriches, for her wounds are incurable, for it has come to Judah, it has come to the gate of my people, to Jerusalem. So, one morning, Mrs. Micah, if she exists, wakes up and says, Hi, honey. What's on your agenda today? And there he is, wailing and howling. And he's about to go out the door. And she says, honey, you forgot something. 
What is that? You forgot your clothing. You're going out naked. No, that's the assignment for today. You're what? I'm going out naked to give a picture to the people of what it's going to be like when the Assyrians come in and destroy Samaria and other towns and strip them naked and take them into captivity. So he had to live out his messages. Let's pray we don't have that kind of an assignment. huh? Well, he says, tell it not in Gath, weep not at all in Beth Apha, roll yourself in the dust. See, those are the places of false worship. Pass by in naked shame, you inhabitant of Shafir, the inhabitant of Zanon, does not go out. Beth Ezel mourns, its place to stand is taken away from you. So when Assyria comes, it is going to not only destroy the northern kingdom, it's going to start moving into the southern kingdom and take town and city after each one another right to the gates of Jerusalem. And it's in the time of Hezekiah. Micah is alive at that time. And Isaiah is alive. And Isaiah writes about it. And he says that the Assyrian army is going to come right around the gate of the city. And you can read more about that uh, elsewhere. And 185,000 of their finest soldiers are encamped right around the walls of the city. And uh, they threaten, and Hezekiah takes their threat to the, uh, to the Lord, and the Lord says, not an arrow, not a sword, not a spear will be sent over this wall. And that night, the death angel, perhaps the Lord Jesus, will move among that camp and destroy all of that army, 185,000 of them. The battle is not yours, it's mine, says the Lord. But all these other towns are going to fall because of their idolatry. Verse 12, the inhabitant of Meroth pined for good, but disaster came down from the Lord to the gate of Jerusalem. O oh, inhabitant of Lachish, that was the first of the towns in the southern kingdom to get into idolatry. O oh, inhabitant of Lachish, harness the chariot to the swift steeds. She was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion. That's where sin began, in that town of Lachish, for city of Jerusalem. The transgressions of Israel were found in you. So it tends to spread. It started up there in the northern kingdom with uh, Jeroboam setting up the golden calves. You remember that up in uh, the northern part of Dan and the southern part of Bethel. He didn't want his people going down to Jerusalem and leaving him and following the king who succeeded Solomon. His name was King Rehoboam. So Jeroboam said, stay up here, worship the gods. These are the ones who led you out of Egypt. And so they worshiped there and they never had a good king up north and God finally had to take them on down. Well, verse 14, therefore you shall give presents to Moresheth Gath, the houses of Achzeb shall be a lie to the kings of Israel. I will yet bring an heir to you, O inhabitant of Mereshah. The glory of Israel shall come to Adullam. Make yourself bald and cut off your hair because of your precious children. Enlarge your baldness like an eagle, for they shall go from you into captivity. God is giving them plenty of warning years before it takes place that they're going to go into captivity because of their idolatry. And what is idolatry? Idolatry is putting anything or anyone in the place of God. And the test is very simple. Am I where I want to be with God? Am I 100% where I want to be with God? In my prayer life, in my giving, in my fellowship, in my service? If I'm 100% perfect, that's great. But if I'm honest, I'm probably not. And if I'm not where I should be, what is keeping me or who is keeping me from it? Think about it. That may be an idol. And God gives you a choice. He says, you take it down or I'll take it down. And uh, when he takes it down, that's not so nice. Well, chapter 2. Now we're talking about the good news of restoration. Sometimes it's hard to hear the voice of the devil and distinguish it from the voice of God. Both can have a negative flavor. Both can say you've done wrong. Both can say there's going to be a price to pay. But the devil goes on to say, there is no hope. You're done. Take care of yourself and do yourself in. Or eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow you die. The voice of God says you've done wrong, but turn. Turn from your wicked ways, and I will hear what you have to say. Kelly and I were teaching on our 
video program, Reach Out with the Lynns, and catch that on uh, YouTube. Just uh, type it in the search engine, Pastor Jerry Lynn or Pastor Kelly Lynn, and uh, catch these videos that we're doing uh, on many different subjects. And we were talking about Second uh, Chronicles chapter 7 this week, something that you hear a lot uh, regarding nations, um, the different nations of the world. And through YouTube, we're reaching uh, a lot of different nations. We've reached, I think, 156 out of the 185 nations in the world so far through uh, YouTube. That's about 83%. And praise God, let's keep going. But uh, I was saying to the people there, I don't care what nation you're in. It may not be the United States, but the same principle applies. Second Chronicles 7.14. And some of those nations we are getting uh, to, to reach are in deep, uh, Muslim countries, uh, territories in the Middle East and Oman and uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and others, they're watching there. And Second Chronicles 7.14, and you're watching on this video right now if it's going out to, to these different nations. Second Chronicles 7.14, this is not a verse for the United States. This is a verse for all nations of all times. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. That's a promise that God made to Solomon. That promise will work today wherever you live. Well, they should have done that at that time. They didn't. They did not pray. They did not turn from their wicked ways. So this is the second message that God is going to uh, be giving them, and uh, he says, Woe to those who devise iniquity and work out evil on their beds. At morning light they practice it, because it is in the power of their hand. So where does evil begin? It doesn't begin in your hand. Oh, I just did that thing. Uh, when people get caught, they say, Oh, I didn't mean that. Oh, yeah, you did. Well, it just happened. My hands reached where they shouldn't have. My eyes went where they shouldn't have. My mouth spoke where it shouldn't have. It didn't just happen. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It began in the heart. It devises. And so if you want to stop iniquity, you stop it right in your mind, right in your bed when you're thinking about it that morning. Woe to those who devise iniquity. Iniquity doesn't just happen. You devise it. You plan it. You think about it. You do all you can to make it happen. They work out evil on their beds. At morning light, they practice it. Get up, first thing they do, instead of worshiping the Lord, they get right into evil. Because it's in the power of their hand. They can do it, therefore they will. They covet fields and take them by violence. King Ahab did that, didn't he? He, uh, he liked that uh, nice summer garden next to his palace, and he wanted it, and the owner didn't want to uh, give it to him, and so his wife said, I'll take care of it. And his wife had the man killed, and the property was then given to King Ahab. So that was the king, and that was the people under him as well. They covet fields, also houses, they seize them, so they oppress a man in his house, a man in his inheritance. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, against this family I am devising disaster, from which you cannot remove your necks. For shall you walk haughtily? For this is an evil time. In that day one shall take up a proverb against you and lament with a bitter lamentation, saying, We are utterly destroyed. He has changed the heritage of my people, how he has removed it from me. To a turncoat he has divided our fields. So we think we're getting away with something, but Proverbs says that the one who is evil is stealing and storing up, and it's going to be given to the righteous. So you may be able to pass it down a generation or two to your family, but it eventually gets back into the hands of the righteous. God is not going to be fooled. We cannot steal and take advantage of others without a consequence to our own lives. Well, verse 6 talks about the fact that um, the people have been listening to false prophets, False prophets, not telling the real news, but the false news. Do not prattle, verse 6. Don't just babble on and on. You say to those who prophesy, so they shall not prophesy to you. They shall not return insult for insult. You who are named of the house of Jacob, is it the spirit of the Lord restricted? Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly? So these false prophets are not telling the true word of God. As Kelly and I have started the radio program um, uh, 
uh, reach out with the Lynns. We're on two of the stations now, and we have been for the last month or so. We've been listening to other stations to try to see what's currently going on. I've been out of the radio market for about two years now, and I wanted to just see what's out there. A lot has changed in the last two years. I hate to be critical. When I first got saved 40 years ago, I turned on the radio stations here, and they were about the Bible. Men and women got on the radio and talked about the Lord, gave scriptures. Now I'm hearing an awful lot more about diet, and I like that. I didn't expect it on a radio program. A lot about pills and vitamins and things like that. Um, and an uh, awful lot about politics. Awful lot about politics now on the radio. Um, and um, I, uh, we, uh, there's some wonderful teachers out there, but I timed one of them. She was going on for about 10 minutes, and she gave one little scripture as just an aside. And I said to Kelly, I think let's continue as we have before. Let's get the word out. Let's just simply read the word and explain it. When the people came back from Babylon, Nehemiah had built the wall. Ezra the prophet came back to teach the people. They all stood before him, thousands, perhaps a million. And he had teachers spread to the right and to the left. And he simply started reading the word. And the teachers began to explain it. They read it and they explained it. In the Reformation, we know about Martin Luther being perhaps the most famous of those, but there were others like Calvin and Zwingli who were helping to turn the people to a system of faith, not works, in salvation. And the way they taught the people was to just simply explain the word. Today, you can still find the commentaries verse by verse of Martin Luther and John Calvin, and uh, that was the old way. Now, it doesn't have to be the only way, and we, we've done topicals at times, and I was trained in that as well, but the Lord has said for this way, it's the old-fashioned way that always worked. Uh, there was an article recently about uh, the uh, new generations, the people from age 18 to 29, the number of them who declare any faith at all in any system has dropped dramatically from 25% a few years ago down to 10, 15%. 15% of the people from age 18 to 29 declare that they have faith of any sort. Christian, Muslim, Hindu, whatever it may be, very few. And they give a number of reasons. The one reason, one it is too much politics. They don't want to associate religion with politics. They want to look at religion without having to be told how they're supposed to vote. And they're finding also that they're not getting the true word of God. And they had two remedies in this article. One was verse by verse teaching, get people back into the knowledge of God's word. The second thing was start singing music that is theologically correct and not focused on me and my feelings, but about God and his glory. Two things. So um, I said to Kelly, let's keep on with the word of God. And we get lots of scripture, and she reads it, and we explain it, and, and we just keep on doing that. And we not only did that, but he said, let's go an extra step. Instead of our 15-minute program being the only impact, let's also add our message in a minute. And so we have a 60-second biblical message with at least one or two scriptures in there, 60 seconds, a quick McDonald's microwave kind of a teaching for you, but get the word out. Faith comes by acrobatics in the worship service, Harley Davidson on the stage, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. So enough of me. Let's get back to the word. All right. Verse eight of chapter two. Lately, my people have risen up as an enemy. You pull off the robe with the garment from those who trust you as they pass by, like men return from war. The women of my people you cast out from their pleasant houses, from their children. You have taken away my glory forever. You pull off the robe with the garment. And the, in those days, they had a law that if you uh, lent some money to somebody or that person owed you something, they could, as collateral, give you their outer garment, uh, but you could only keep it until nightfall because they got cold. That's all they had. They had to sleep in it. And uh, they would keep it overnight, but not only take the outer robe, but the uh, under robe as well. They took all they possibly could from them. And they did all they could to cast out the defenseless women and their children and uh, took their property, trying to seize whatever they could from somebody else. 
Verse 10, Arise and depart, for this is not your rest. Because it is defiled, it shall destroy. Yes, with utter destruction. If a man should walk in a false spirit and speak a lie, saying, I will prophesy to you of wine and drink, even he would be the prattler of this people. So there were those who were prophesying. And uh, give me a good meal and I'll prophesy. Give me a really good meal and lots of wine, I'll give you a great prophecy. And uh, we learned this early on. We had a couple of fellows come through here, and I don't want to judge their hearts, but uh, as they would come in and, and give prophecy, uh, after a nice meal that we had and a nice offering for them, they would say the most glowing things about us, and uh, especially about the pastor. Of course, they were all true about me, right? And I thought to myself, <laughs> I, I want the guy that comes in here, has a good meal and a great offering, and says, thus saith the Lord God, the pastor needs to get his act together, he's doing this and that wrong, etc. That guy, I would tend to believe. But people tend to want to make you happy. And not, that's not prophets, pastors. Let's entertain you, let's make you happy, let's make you feel good because then you're going to be sending money in, etc., etc. Well, you know, I'd like to have a nice feel-good message, and there is a feel-good message here, but it has to come at the expense of repenting from sin. That's the true gospel of God. It's not the gospel, Jesus loves you and wants to bless you. The gospel is you're a sinner. You need to turn from your sins, call upon Jesus. He cleanses you and then he'll bless you and never give you tribulation. Wrong. You'll still go through tribulation, but he'll be there with you to bless you and to bless others and to witness for them and you'll receive crowns eventually. That's the gospel. We need to get back to the pure word of God. All right. Here's the, here's the message, though. It's not all negative. Verse 12, here's the restoration. I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep of the fold. This is Jesus, Matthew 25, returning and calling all of the nation of Israel back home. They shall make a loud noise because of so many people. It's going to be a tremendous number of people coming back into the land. The one who breaks open will come up before them. They will break out, pass through the gate, and go out by it. Their king will pass before them with the Lord at their head. This is Jesus. He's the king. He will be the king of Israel. Even as it said on his indictment when he was crucified, king of Israel, it'll come to pass in that day in the millennium. And he'll be not only their king, he'll be their Lord. And you and I are going to be here with him as the bride of Christ. Well, chapter 3. He's still trying to give them a chance to repent. Judgment will come to the wicked rulers because God looks at leaders and to whom much is given, much is required. Hear now, O heads of Jacob, and you rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know justice, you who hate good and love evil, who strip the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones? And whether that's a literal stripping or whether that just means taking their goods and starving them out, who also eat the flesh of my people, flay their skin from them, break their bones and chop them in pieces like meat for the pot, like flesh in the cauldron. Now this is exactly what Assyria is going to do physically. The soldiers were known to take the skin off the backs of the people, flay their bodies and put them on the walls to intimidate anybody who would resist them. They were wicked. They would take the heads off of the men and they would stack them up on piles on each side of the gate. Uh, and they were so bad that some areas actually committed suicide when they knew the Assyrians were coming. The Jews did that when the Romans were coming in 70 AD. I visited Masada. Did you ever go down to Masada and see that area in Jerusalem? Well, they committed suicide rather than have the Romans come and, uh, and, and destroy them. And um, look at ISIS and what they've been doing uh, these days, Boko Haram and others uh, as well. Horrible, horrible things. But Israel was not doing that physically. But they were doing it in terms of starving people out, not caring for them, caring only for themselves, not having a sense of social justice and the, the justice of the Lord to reach out to others. Well, verse 4, then they will cry to the Lord, but he will not hear them. So when you do these wicked things and you cry out to God, he doesn't hear. He will even hide his face from them at that time because they have been evil in their deeds. Isaiah says the same thing. 
writing about the same time. God's ear is not heavy that he cannot hear. His arm is not short that it cannot save. But your sins have separated you from your God. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who make my people stray, who chant peace while they chew with their teeth, but who prepare war against him, who puts nothing into their mouths. So they make all sorts of promises, but they just simply take from the people and give nothing in return. And we can make application of our lives as well. Those who make great glowing promises. Uh, we're going to give you this, we're going to give you that. And uh, there are those who, uh, we see certainly in politics, we're filled with all kinds of people at all different levels. When I get into office, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and the other. And then you look back on their record after they've gone and nothing was accomplished. Ah, oh, but they did do well financially. And uh, they did get good speaking engagements, and now they're chairman of the board of some organization. So we're filled with that sort of thing, not just in politics, but in, in business and otherwise. When I take over this corporation, it's going to be turned around and yada, yada, yada but uh, how much of it really comes to pass. So verse 6, Therefore you shall have night without vision, you shall have darkness without divination, the sun shall go down on the prophets, and the day shall be dark for them, so the seers shall be ashamed, and the diviners abashed. Indeed, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer from God. Talk about devastation. Is there anything worse in this world than not hearing from God? God says, because of your sins, your prayers aren't being heard. Your skies are like brass. Your, your ground is hard. The prayers are just ricocheting back and forth. After we see what Malachi speak about tithing and putting God first, boom, no word from God for 400 years years. Israel does not hear from God for 400 years until John the Baptist comes on the scene and says, repent, the Messiah is coming. Verse 8, but truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Now hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel who abhor justice and pervert all equity, who build up Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with iniquity, her heads judge for a bribe, her priests teach for pay, and her prophets divine for money. So they're led by people who are just in it for the money. Follow the money. When you have trouble knowing what's going on, whether it be in family or business or government, and something doesn't smell quite right, follow the money. Somebody's into the money. Well, that's what they did here. The judges were judging for a bribe, giving justice based on who offers the most money. Priests teaching for pay. What would you like to hear? Do you want to hear about judgment from Micah or do you want to hear Jesus loves you just as you are and everything is going to be beautiful in your life and we will give you no more than a five minute message and which would you rather have? And so they teach for pay. Prophets divine for money. You want to hear from God? How much do you have? You want to hear something really good from God? A little bit more. And so it's all about the money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, is not the Lord among us? No harm can come upon us. You know, we're on God's side. He's on our side. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed like a field. Jerusalem shall become heaps of ruins and the mountains of the temple like the bare hills of the forest. So it had spread from north to south. Sin spreads. And uh, it moved from the north into Lachish and then on down to the other towns and eventually right into Jerusalem to the point where Baal worship was right in the temple itself uh, under the wicked king Manasseh. And so it's, and also Solomon. Why Solomon, with all of his wives, brings in all their false gods? Sin spreads. That's why it's important, as best you can, to keep clear from sin in your own life and from those around you. Now, you have to go to work, you have to go to school, you have families, but do the best you can to keep yourself insulated from it. When somebody in the family has a cold, 
you take extra precaution so the germs don't spread. You make sure that dishes are washed, that you keep your distance, you don't hug. I've had people walk out that door, I put my hand out, they say, Pastor, I've got a cold. And I say, thank you. I've done the same thing. No hugs today, cold. We keep our distance. We do what we can to protect ourselves. They can still be in fellowship, but I don't want your cold. We can still be in the family, we can still be at work, we can still be in church, but I don't want your sin. And so do what you can to not spread it and make sure you don't take it in yourself. Chapter 4, blessings will come in the millennium. That thousand year reign of peace is coming. We are studying this in Revelation right now and we just saw that the next prophetic event for the church will be the catching away of the church in the rapture. Then the world goes through the tribulation. And at the end of that seven year tribulation, the millennium, we come back with the Lord in Revelation 19, riding white horses. I'm a little nervous. I never was comfortable on horses, but I'll learn. And we're gonna ride back on those horses. We're gonna be here with him as we start the millennium, the thousand year reign of Christ. And chapter four talks about that reign. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow to it. Talking about Mount Zion in Jerusalem. If you're not quite sure where that is, Google, when you get home, Jerusalem, and you'll see umpteen number of pictures of Jerusalem skyline, and right in the middle of it is that gold dome, Dome of the Rock Mosque, the third most holy Muslim site in all the world. And that's roughly the location where the temple's gonna be. My guess is, uh, to not get the Muslims upset if they're still around, and they might be, is a wall is going to be built there. There is 10 acres just to the north. Look to the right. There's 10 acres, nothing but a park. Go out there and have a sandwich and a soda. Nobody's going to bother you. Uh, some believe that may be the actual location of the old original temple of Solomon. In any event, that's the general vicinity, and that's where the people are going to flow to it to see the Lord Jesus. Many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion, the law shall go forth and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So people are going to flow to Jerusalem to see the Lord Jesus in the temple. You and I are gonna be here on earth in our resurrection bodies, ruling and reigning with him. And uh, as far as they're coming to see him, he's going to have a solution for church attendance. We don't have church attendance solutions like that today. I told my wife as I pulled out of the driveway, I looked at the parking lot of the Lutheran church across the street. I can tell the season of the year by the parking lot. Uh, two weeks before Easter, and then Easter, it is packed. No place to park. Week after Easter, a couple of parking spaces. This is now, what, about a month after Easter? Oh, you can throw a bomb and not hit a car if you tried to there. Um, and uh, even in our church and other churches, too. Uh, one of Kelly's friends says, I love church. I love church. Christmas and Easter, fabulous. Well, uh, the Lord's going to have a better church attendance than that. I think it's uh, Zechariah that says, Hey, don't come to visit the Lord once a year. He won't rain on your land. You won't have crops. You won't eat. Best way to get people to church is to say, if you don't come, you starve to death, right? Well, we're not going to do that, but that's going to be the idea then. You, you do come once a year, or he will not rain on your land. And uh, as far as what you and I are going to be doing, uh, we're going to be here to enforce his reign, which is going to be a reign of iron. Not a reign of grace, but a reign of iron. Worship the Lord or pay the consequence. He's going to be ruling supreme at that time. And at the end of that millennium, there'll be so many who are standing up on the inside. Oh, sitting down on the outside. Yes, Jesus, but don't love him. They're going to rebel. Satan is released from the bottomless pit. And he says, who's on my side? He has so many people in their natural bodies who want to side with Satan that God says, that's enough of this party, and he torches them from heaven and destroys them, and that's it. And then we go on into the white throne judgment, and then in the eternal state, that's for another time. But in any event, uh, the Lord says they're going to come from all different directions, uh, some because they love the Lord, 
others because they have to go to church, so to speak. In verse 3, he will judge between many peoples, rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Very famous phrase, I think it's on the wall in the United Nations, the great aspiration of mankind, but it isn't going to happen. We're not going to have true godly peace apart from the Prince of Peace. When Jesus comes, then he will establish it. And again, it's going to be because of his rule, and it's not going to be all because they love him. You and I love him, and we have peace because of that. But his peace will be over those who love him and those who are fearing him. And uh, then there'll be no need for war. Can you imagine the amount of money that is spent worldwide, including this country in particular, on armaments? And if that could be spent on agriculture and implements to produce food for those who are starving, well, there's going to be plenty of abundance in the time of the millennium. But everyone shall sit under his vine, under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. Can you imagine that? No fear. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all people walk each in the name of his God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Well, that kind of reminds me of what Joshua said on the eve before they entered Canaan. Uh, you decide who you want to serve. The gods of the land, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And verse 5, I think, is important for us. That's something every person has to decide here on earth. All people walk each in the name of his God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God. But other families don't have to go to church. They don't read the Bible. They don't have to see Jesus Christ as the only way to heaven. No, they don't. But we're not other families. As for our family, we're going to serve the Lord. And then each member has to make that personal decision and that personal commitment. But it's got to start with somebody in the family. And I thank God for Kelly as she raised her kids that they learned to love the Lord and to share the word with others. Uh, I was, we were listening to a radio program and a video we had done on this about a, just a quick story about one of her children that when he was so small, he was on his on her knee, and he was, she was praying Psalm 31 uh, over, or, I'm sorry, Proverbs 31 over him. And uh, this proverb was, uh, she would pray over him daily, this proverb, uh, and she has it memorized, what my son and what son of my womb, son of my vows, do not give your strength to women, nor your ways to that which destroys kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes intoxicating drink, lest they for drink and forget the law, pervert the justice of all afflicted, etc., etc. She prayed that over that little boy whose father had an alcohol problem, and she prayed over him daily, daily. That young boy didn't even recall that. To this day, alcohol, to our knowledge, does not pass his lips. He has faithfully uh, kept himself, and he is now married to a most lovely young lady. And uh, it was a mother's prayers and a mother's declaring those vows over that boy that he has no desire to drink or to be loose or to walk in the ways of this world. So you lay your hands on your children, the little babies. I don't care how small they are. Uh, even in their womb, put hands on tummies and begin to pray for it then. But declare God's truth. God will honor it. His word will not return void. Well, he says now in verse 6, In that day I will assemble the lame, I will gather the outcast and those whom I have afflicted. I will make the lame a remnant and the outcast a strong nation. And the Lord's doing the same thing today. Somebody once said, if I were in a gathering of people and Jesus were to walk in to that room. And I can see that most of them were fairly normal, but one of them was perhaps in a wheelchair. Or one of them was obviously afflicted in some way. And I were to watch Jesus, where do you think he would go? To that person who needed it, that lame person, that person who was afflicted. And so he cares about you and he cares about me. So when I walk into a room, I want to find the person who has the most money and is best looking and the most fun and has a lot of jokes and can offer me out to dinner, or go to the one who is afflicted and lame and who needs not me, but Jesus. Be a servant. Follow the Lord. He'll take you to some wonderful places.
So the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on even forever. And you, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come, even the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. Nor, and now why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in your midst? Has your counselor perished? For pangs have seized you like a woman in labor. Be in pain, labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in birth pangs. For now you shall go forth from the city, you shall dwell in the field, and to Babylon you shall go. There you shall be delivered, there the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. He is going to bring Israel back from all of her bondage. All of her bondage. The bondage of self, the bondage of sin, the bondage of the world. Now also many nations have gathered against you. Isn't that true today? many nations against Israel. They say, let her be defiled and let our eye look upon Zion, but they do not know the thoughts of the Lord, nor do they understand his counsel, for he will gather them like sheaves to the threshing floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make your horn iron. I'll give you strength. And I will make your hooves bronze, strong. You shall beat in pieces many peoples. I will consecrate their gain to their Lord and their substance to the Lord of the whole earth. So she's going to be the victor instead of the victim. She's going to be a blessing. She'll be the head instead of the tail. She'll be the lender instead of the borrower. And so it is not only for Israel, it's also for all who are believers in the Lord Jesus. It's for you and for me, for those of you watching on television or perhaps on YouTube. I don't care what nation you're in, as I said. You pray for your nation, but you pray for yourself. God wants to heal us of our sin, but the gospel is not God is good and blesses you abundantly no matter what. That is not the good news. Uh, that is unfortunately what's being taken as good news. The good news is that while we are sinners, there is one who has paid the price for our sins. And God is wanting to save us. He wants to save each one of us from our sins. And he offers Jesus Christ as the way, the only way to the Father. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and you don't come to the Father except through me. So let's bow our hearts before him now. Judgment and blessing. Father, that's the same old theme that always has existed. Ever since Genesis chapter 3, it's been judgment, followed by repentance, followed by blessing. Lord, you took all of our sins and sicknesses and sorrows, and you judged them. You judged them on your son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins and all of sin's consequences. Lord Jesus, thank you for paying the price of judgment that we might have blessing. Lord Jesus, come into our hearts. Live your life in us. We will live for you and we will serve you. Thank you for the blessings that you offer us, Lord. Help us now to go out and be true prophets, true priests, true judges, as we take the good news of salvation to the world. Help us, Lord, to reach out as far as we can for the time that we have. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. small